Hey y'all, hey, it's Michelle. And today I wanna to just get right into it. I wanna talk about five superpowers that novelists and fiction writers like me know that you need to know too, because I'm telling you, going forward, if you can just grasp these five, you will become a mental monster. So let's get right into it. Number one, we understand how to persuade. Number two, we really understand. I made notes, so I might glance down. We really know how to how to really work some nuance. Number three, we understand how to listen and hear because they are two different things and we exploit them all. And number four, we understand how to exploit gaps in knowledge. And last but certainly not least, number five, we understand the four Ds. And that is we understand discourse, discussion, dialogue, and debate. And yes, they are different. And once you understand which one you can use at will and how to move people to the one that you want, you are a beast. So let's go back and revisit each one of these, okay? All right, the first one I wanna talk to you about is how we persuade. Now, when you are trying to get someone to believe a flat character could actually exist, oh baby, you better understand how to use tone and mood. And tone and mood are not just for writing. Tone and mood is dog walking y'all every day. And the reason why is because it's going over your head in nuance, and I'll talk about that in a second. But when you want to persuade, understand that you can change someone's will um, uh, excuse me, their mood at will, meaning you can use it by tone. And tone is not just the tone of your voice with the energy. You know how your mama used to say, take that bass out of your out of your tone when you're talking to me. No, yeah, that's a way of doing it. But what I'm talking about is more diabolical. What I'm talking about is word choice. You know, you hear it every day. And I'm gonna tell you, since you've heard this and it's kind of like probably reminded you, now, when you listen to the news, when you listen to people on social media, when you have conversations with folks, you're gonna be paying attention to the word choice. So for instance, if somebody says it, was dreary outside today. They could be talking about the rain or, you know, just gray clouds. If someone decides mm -hmm, or chooses to change your mood about it, they could say things like, say for instance, they want to put you into a fearful mood. They could say things like, today it was really uh, dangerous out. It uh, The roads were slippery. They're still saying it was dreary or it was raining, but the word choice now infected you, the listener, to change your mood about the situation authors we do that all the time it is based on what the words we choose not only how they're said now when you can combine them together oh baby you are doing something but word choice and tone can change someone's mood so <laughs> i shouldn't be saying this but say message you need to borrow some money from somebody you can construct your statement based on the words you choose to affect their mood concerning what you guys are talking about i know i know it's dangerous but these are superpowers that we have and we use them at will all right so the next one and like I said, I'm, I'm looking at notes too. Um, okay, so like the next one I wanna talk about is the nuance. I, I've talked a little bit, just hints here and there about nuance. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this is the way people are starting to move the line. It used to be, okay, there's this term called the Overton window and it's a political term. And what the Overton window is, is nuance from a political side that has now permeated over into the other, um, into the social. And you're being affected by it. And Michelle, this is Michelle, uh, with Brilliant Quest is trying to help you understand, wink, wink, wake up, this is happening. And as authors, we do it all the time. So with nuance, nuance is, is subtle. It is smooth, it's a smooth criminal. And with nuance, the way we work nuance and, oh, let me finish the thought about Overton Window. The Overton Window is a process. It started with think tanks in DC and uh, it's a process of moving the population to, to expand and to uh, accept bigger swings in, in government, bigger swings in policy. And so what the Overton Window would do is it would propagate an absurd idea so that it could get people really riled up and like, that will never stand. And they wanted that almost to the farcical levels because it has backfired on us now to where everybody's accepting those farcical levels. But I digress, let me get back. It has gone to the point now where you can see the Overton window because what it'll do is it'll put out something so uh, absurd. Uh, and then what they do is once they get everybody in a hubbub over the absurdity of something, the very thing that they wanted that caught, that you needed to move people to that side, it looks like a more acceptable choice. It's like, give them the extreme so that we can give them uh, the, the progression of it. And, and I'm not talking about political sides or leanings. I'm really just talking about where they want to take you. So the Overton window, like I said, started in the political side, but now it has moved into the social where you have people on social mood, uh, media doing uh, way over the top stuff so that they can get the shock value so that what they really want to give you you wouldn't have accepted it before. But now because it is tame, more tame than or tamer. Is that the right word? Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, now that it's uh, more tame, you are willing to accept it. And that is nuance. But that is nuance uh, that is kind of, um, it, it's not elegant. It's not as subtle as the real nuance. And the real nuance is here. The real nuance is desire. 
So remember I talked about how the Overton window started with the politics and then it moved into social media and then now it moves into the, the society. Same thing happens with the real, uh, the, the, the real one of uh, nuance and that is desire. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of history. Back when um, the World War II was ending, uh, certain countries that won were, had more cash or more opportunity because let's face it, wars make folk rich if you are in the right, whatever. And then it trickles down to the masses and so people tend to have a little more money. Well, uh, the powers that be, you know, the big they, they, them, <laughs> the powers that be, they decided that they wanted more of this money coming back to them. And they didn't discover this. It's just that they, they refined it. And the uh, refinement is based in our feelings. Oh, yes based in our feelings. And they discovered that when you appeal to someone's desire and what they want, if you give it to them in the way that you can control, you can make them do anything. So the, the big game of what authors do when we're creating characters, one of the first things we decide is what does this character desire? What does this character want? And then to make you read a book and enjoy it, we put conflicts, obstacles, and denial and make the um, characters strive more and more to get what they want and desire through the telling of the story, then it becomes very entertaining for the reader. Well, likewise, in real life, people do that. Case in point, going back to the, to the 40s and all of that, they discovered, and when I say they, I'm talking about uh, politics and large mass, you know, the macro level of society, the powers that be discovered that people desired to be wealthy. But then they realized that there was a nuance to that. And you know what the nuance was? People didn't desire to be wealthy. They desired to feel wealthy. Thus the explosion of, uh, affluent products, luxury goods, and items to the masses, where it used to be behind a gate of respectability of, we don't talk about that, you know, talk as rich. Oh, it's, it's, it's gauche. It's gross to talk about money. But they discovered the nuance of controlling people is to make them crave and get the stuff that the rich had so that they could discover, the they, the big they, could discover what motivated you? What desires did you have? Once they learned your desires, they could get you to do whatever they wanted. And I'm going to give you um, some quick ones so that you understand exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm talking about this stuff has been around for a long time. And authors like me, we use this stuff to make our characters real. But now it's there's no difference between the characters we create and what's actually going down. All right. So I'm going to just give you some of these desires and feelings that they have learned about us that you need to know. You, you need to understand how you're being finessed, <laughs> the nuances that they're using. So remember I told you, they discovered you don't need to be wealthy. They don't need to have a way to give you wealth. Oh no, they need to figure out how to make you feel wealthy, okay? So here are some of the desires. Um, some of the desires that we have in our, our, our psychology of being, in our, in our psyche, in our psychological subconscious levels are, these are actual uh, pain points and um, things that we aspire to. And they are, we have desires for what we want, and we want to avoid certain things. So that's pain. They figure out what we want to avoid. Mm -hmm. Then we have things that we want to gain. So they figure out what we want to possess and what we want to save. One of the biggest ones is we want to gain reputation. We want to save time and we want to avoid poverty. Think about that. You will do a lot of stuff to have those particular desires met. And the next one is they learn what we desire to be and what we desire to do. That is why certain professions are uh, given all the love and they become highly reputable so much so that a, a lot of classes or ethnicities uh, try to own them, you know, because this has become reputable. But you've been you've been finessed. You've been nuanced. So let's talk about the feelings of desires. And these, when I call them out, you're gonna be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. So get this. We want to. And you can feel you can feel all of these, some of them, some of them, but at least one. So here are some of the feeling desires that they use uh, in a nuanced way to get us to do what they want. And that is they offer you the feeling of being successful, less mortal, meaning that when you're less mortal, they offer you uh, health, wealth and potions. They offer you a way to um, push back the ravages of aging for as long as possible. Think about eye creams and all the, the accoutrement that people put on their face, you know, with that kabuki theater makeup that they be wearing, you know, to try to still look young um, because that's people wanting to feel less mortal. Uh, they want they know, they know that we want to feel independent, whether we really are or not. Mm -hmm. We want to feel more secure. Uh, we want to have more attraction. We want to be wanted. You know, that's the relationships, the dating, um, that's getting into the country clubs. We want to be respected. You know, put some respect on my name. We want to feel comfortable mm -hmm. and we want to feel worth it. We, we want our lives to mean something. So because they understand that there are some actions um, based on fear and pleasure, meaning that you want to, there are certain things you want to avoid. There are certain things you want to gain and save. And there are certain things you want to be and do. And then there are the feelings. They got your number. Mm -hmm. They have your number. Okay. So that was number two. So let me recap. Authors understand how to persuade. And we use that by word choice of tone. And uh, we move people's moods at will based on 
those word choices that we choose. Then the nuance of desire. That is how they finesse us to get us to do stuff. Remember the Overton window? They'll give you something ex extreme so that you come back down to what they really wanted you to do. And they do it by understanding what you desire. So number three, are you still with me? Okay, let's get going. So with number three, authors understand how to listen and hear. Oh, uh -huh, it's two different things, listening and hearing. Now, sometimes you might hear people say, oh, you need to listen and not just hear. No, baby, you need to do both. And we use this to help bring out the inflections of a person's personality. And so some of the things that authors learn how to do when we're making our characters listen, we make our characters home in on subject matter. So say, for instance, you want to put this to the, you know, put this into practice and become more brilliant in your quest of conversations. You know, it's funny. They have this thing called active listening. And these are some of the things that you'll find in active listening as well. Listen to the subject matter. The subject matter of what someone is talking about is going to give you a pretty good indicator of what level of conversation you're having. Are you having a surface level conversation or are they wanting to go deeper with you? There are some people that no matter how much you talk to them, they're never going to go below the surface. And it's not that they're ignorant. It's just either they decided you shall not go no further with them, or they're just not, they don't want to do that. That's um, not where their mental energy is wanting to go with you. Okay. Uh, it, it also lends to, if you are in close relationships, this is a, a pretty good way uh, to, to convey, like say for instance, if I'm, if I'm writing this as a, an author, I can convey pain and anguish in a relationship by how I have the listening skills and what they notice from the characters, because understanding subject matter, uh, tells you what level of intimacy and all these different things that they have between each other. And if there's some incongruence, then you have a problem. You would do well to, to take this on if you don't already do this by starting to pay attention when you have conversations with people and you're listening. What's the subject matter? Another part of subject matter is who is the subject? Mm -hmm. That's another way to quickly understand more subconsciously. I mean, more about the person that they might not understand, but are doing subconsciously. Meaning, who's the subject? Is it all about me? You know, oh, I'm done talking. Tell me what you think of me. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Or is it we where when you have conversations, they can talk about themselves, you, them and you together. But it is about what's going on in each other's lives. That's um, an area where we do the quote unquote active listening. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the uh, fifth one of the differences between the discourse, the discussion and all of that, um, because that is part of this. Meaning that when you know how to actively listen, you will be um, aware of what type of of interaction you're having because it matters because a lot of people don't understand the kind of interaction they have and a lot of times they only go to one and it's, it's just it's not good okay so the subject matter now here i'm gonna just i'm just gonna give you the tea right here when you want to become a superpower in the listening listen for metaphors when you're talking to someone do they use them or not and if they use them what are they putting together and you can use similes and stuff like that now, here is the inside tip for you. With metaphor, when someone uses metaphor, it is a snapshot to be able to tell you the depth and the breadth of what they know. Because the more a person has exposure, experience, knowledge, and um, facts and, and a large database, the more interesting their metaphors are going to be. If their metaphors are cliche, meaning they are overused, people always use them, you're probably talking to a person who has not kept up with expanding their ability to conversate, listen, and, you know, learn, okay? And that's important because there are people out there actively evaluating you on this very thing because based on what they discover on how well you use metaphor, and if you don't use metaphor, you're just kind of boring because metaphor is a way for us to take a pattern, a symbol, or something that we know to explain something that is more complex or less known. So that denotes you your ability to be creative, to uh, create new expressions or new ways to convey a thought. And if you don't do that, bless you. Mm, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> let's go on. Um, and so that's another thing uh, that I want to make sure that I say on this is that if you want to become a superpower, up your metaphor game. Do you know if you understand and can use metaphor, you can become a comedian and make a lot of money. You can become a salesperson and sell anything to anyone. You can become a great conversationalist, a person who can teach because when you uh, tell someone, um, okay, this is the concept and it's this. Uh, and, and you know, you can use simile as well. Simile, you can tell the difference between a metaphor and a simile simply by the word like, or it's like this, okay? And people use them interchangeably, but it's a really good way to convey and to be able to infuse a conversation with excitement and all this kind of stuff. Now, please stay with me on this because I'm going to talk to you now about hearing. Remember I said listening and hearing is, is just, are, are just as important? Well, here's another thing that good novelists understand. Hearing. There is a reason why hearing is still a thing because when you hear, you can hear things like patterns. Mm -hmm. You can hear the cadence of someone's voice. Um, there are FBI people that will teach you that um, 
we hear. They'll say words like we listen, but we hear. And then they'll talk about what they actually hear. Now, hearing a lot of times is sound. And so you can pick up on the, a pattern of the way someone speaks. You can pick up on a lot of times if people are lying or confused. And that's because they'll have hesitations. Um, they will have irregular cadence, you know, the rhythm of how they speak. A lot of things can be picked up by hearing someone. Also, they will uh, expose vocal tales and you can pick up on the energy of someone's intention by hearing them. Okay, so these are some more devices that uh, novelists like myself, we use uh, that you should know too. All right, now speaking of that, we are really good at exploiting gaps in knowledge. And why is that important? It's important because if you're trying to uh, find your way to success in any endeavor, you're eventually going to have to interact with someone and either you're going to test them or they're going to test you or it's going to be mutual. And I will tell you, gaps in knowledge are right in there when someone is trying to establish uh, status with you. And we use this to denote pecking order. When a character meets another character, they'll have a conversation. I'm going to tell you, you do this already when you're looking for gaps in knowledge. When you ask someone, and so what do you do for a living? You would think that that's just innocuous conversation. Mm -mm. So consciously, you're trying to figure out, is this person on my level? Am I not on their level? If I'm above them, let me start interrogating them, because that's really what you're doing. You're interviewing them to figure out their gaps in knowledge. And if I know more than them, if I have more experience than them, because I want to, I want to get our pecking order in, in, in line. I want to, I want and it's a very masculine thing, I know, but it's a societal thing as well. So here are some of the ways that people look for gaps in order, uh, gaps in knowledge. Remember, I talked about some of the hearing tales like having hesitancy. Another one is either having repetitive questions or not enough or the right questions. Now, y'all, <laughs> I'm telling myself, when I was younger, I was, I was on a date with this guy and we were talking. And I'm thinking we're having this a great little conversation. And I started noticing patterns. And his, this was the pattern. This was he kept. This is what he kept asking me. What that word mean? What that word mean? <laughs> I was like, are you serious? And at the time, I had not had this kind of uh, knowledge and experience. And I, so I found it to be quite annoying. And I was ready to end the date <laughs> at that moment. I was like, how many times is he going to ask me what that mean? <laughs> and so he was now starting to you guess it. Is to expose his gaps in knowledge. Now, in hindsight, I can appreciate him because on the other hand, there are people who have too much pride and ego where they don't understand what you're saying at all and they will not ask a question. They won't ask for clarity. Then there are people that won't ask for clarity, not because of ego, because but because they don't understand the types of questions to ask for clarity. And so gaps in knowledge is something that we exploit to reveal a shadow side of someone or to reveal what is the status level of the people in this interaction? And that is something that is done in real life all the time. The next time you're out and someone leaves with, you know, the innocent, oh, what do you do for a living? Pay attention to everything after that. I want you to listen. I want you to hear. I want you to figure out what they want and desire. And I want you to learn to identify the tone, what words are being used and how are they being used? I've already given you four powerful ways to understand how to use these superpowers at will. So let's, let's finish up because this is one that if you get this, a lot of your interaction with others is going to uh, improve exponentially, leaps and bounds. And that is understanding the difference between discussion, discord, di uh, dialogue, and debate. Now, you might say, oh, I know the difference. And you could very well know the difference. But a lot of times, depending on your status, your personality type, you will fall into certain ones that are your, just your go-tos. There are a lot of people out there that don't even realize that the only thing they excel at is trying to have a debate. That's why people hate to see them coming. They're like, you, all I asked you was, can you, give me a, can you give me a cup of coffee? Now, I don't drink coffee, but can you give me a cup of coffee? And it becomes a whole debate about well, why, well, why you can't get it, you know, and all of that. And so I just kind of want to go over these really quickly, down and dirty. You can look them up because I don't want to make this too long, but I did want to make sure that I gave you something needy that you can use in your brilliant quest. And that is understanding these. So with a uh, discord, a uh, discourse, excuse me. A discourse is a uh, structured kind of statement or a speech um, that you give that is like a monologue, like I'm doing right now. This is a discourse, okay? It is, like I said, structured. Usually there are some persuasive elements in it, like I'm trying to get you to start making use of these five superpowers. So what you are experiencing right now is a discourse, okay? Then the other three are different in that they require more than one person. Oh, and let me go back to discourse really quickly. A discourse, like I said, is structured. It does have persuasive um, elements to it where it has structure and it wants to give you information so that you can consider it and possibly even make use of it. There is another thing called a soliloquy. And a soliloquy is usually impromptu, but it's just when somebody just gives a speech and they just keep going on and on and on about this point that they want to make. And when I use them for a character, it's usually because the character 
uh, wants to just educate somebody about something that they didn't need to know, but they let them go on or they're frustrated or, you know, it's kind of where it's, it's not totally needed, but they just go on and on. Okay. Whereas discourse has a purpose, a structure and a plan. Okay. Now let's get to the ones where it requires more than one person. Discussion. Now out of discussion, dialogue and debate, discussion is the tamest. It is the, is the one that is the most innocent. And the reason why is because a discussion is what most people think they're having when a lot of times they're either having dialogue or debate. Discussion is where you are just trying to see where the conversation takes you. You're not trying to present your point and then stand 10 toes on it. You are willing and able to be moved. Everybody is because it's where the group or the, the two individuals, you need to have at least two people to have a discussion, where the group is willing to learn and grow together in a new undefined, not predefined, undefined way. Whereas a dialogue, a dialogue is kind of like the polite version of a debate in that if you're really honest, and when I write dialogue, I keep this in mind, that when you have a dialogue, you really want to get your point across. You can tell people <laughs> who are this close to not, um, uh, to tipping over in, into a debate because you can be having a conversation. You think you're having a, a discussion. You're not, you're really having a dialogue that's about to tip over into a debate. When a person says something like, well, back to what I was saying, or let me finish my thought. <laughs> that is your telltale sign and i laugh because i see it all the time now that i'm aware of it and i use it as a instrument and i try to sharpen it as much as i can uh day by day getting better in every way i see it all the time i'm like these people probably think they're having a discussion and they are one step from a volatile debate because this dialogue is about to go off the rails now like i said dialogue is not all about trying to just get your point out dialogue usually is about people interacting and having conversation but unlike discussion there is this tendency and this kind of like low level understanding that I'm going to tell you what I think, and then you can tell me what you think, <laughs> okay? And when I write dialogue, dialogue is not a back and forth like, hi, hi, how are you? I'm fine. No. Dialogue, when I, when I write it as a, a novelist, is, hi, this is my point. Oh, good. Well, this was my point. Oh, well, I see where you were going, but my point was this, and oh, okay, fine. Well, let me do this other point. You know, it, it, it's about each side trying to get their point across, be heard, be understood. You see? That's different from discussion. Okay, so then now let's talk about debate. And this is the one that I see the most that once you understand this, you are going to be a mental beast because there are times when you want something to go into a dialogue, um, excuse me, um, a debate. And then there are times when you want to have the magical power to move a debate back all the way over to a discussion. Because in debate, it has conflict. And most, the average person is not trained on how to do proper conflict resolution. So it becomes an emotional battle of wills and, and wit and probably fisticuffs. And people need to engage in debate in the right way, but the average person does not understand. And I'm telling you this because I, I just need you to understand that when you, when the world has a mic, social media, and anybody can get out and say anything, you must understand the nuances of the different types of conversations and discussions out there. So real quickly, how do you move a volatile debate back to a discussion? The way you do it is to exploit the ability to question. Now, one of the things that when I first decided that I was going, let me see if I have it here, that I was going to take writing seriously about 16 years ago was I went back to the foundations. I'm talking about, I went back to schoolhouse rock so I could understand grammar and all these different things. And I'm still learning y'all. Um, but I learned, relearned the four types of questions or, st or sentences. You know, you have declarative, your um, in, in, interrog in, in, inter uh, interrogation, exclamation. And uh, I always forget the third one. I'm trying to look and see if I can. Oh, here it is. Imperative. I get that. Uh, forget that one. You don't have to look those up. I'm just simply saying that people interchange these different sentences at will and people who understand them, this is a shortcut to move somebody from a debate back to a discussion. The fastest way when applicable is to use a question and interrog interrogation, meaning, oh, that's interesting. Well, what do you think about this? Moving them to something that is not as heated or peppery. And just like that, you can take a debate that's going to get heated and move it all the way back over to a discussion where everybody is back to where we're just exploring. All right. And so these are some of the things that a lot of times no uh, novelists who write professionally, we take it for granted. And when you're out in the wild, you're like, but you don't realize that maybe we just need to take a pause and tell people this thing, these things. So I'm going to land the plane, but let me go in and recap this real quick, because this kind of stuff. I'm telling you right now, I gave you the snapshot of it in under an hour where you can go to a school and pay $15,000 and they're going to, they're going to try to teach, they're going to teach you this hopefully. And you're going to be thankful for it, but you can say right here, big sis, Michelle, put me on game to start looking at this. Now I, I put out a little short the other day where I talked about understanding that in this time, there are three words that you need to know. And that is uh, gap nuance and clever. So today, if you notice, I covered 
the gap and the nuance. I, stay tuned because I will cover the clever and you don't want to miss it because it's pretty cool. But to recap, here are the five superpowers that um, novelists, skilled novelists like me know that you now know too. That is one, we know how to persuade. We use the proper words to make you have the mood we want you to have. Number two, we understand the nuance of understanding your desires. So that when we know what you want and desire, we can dog walk you. <laughs> we can make you do whatever we want to. Now, I'm not saying we do that. I'm talking about, you know, we write characters and we make them believable by using these devices. Number three, we understand the power of listening and hearing. With listening, you want to listen for subject matter. You want to listen to how the person, who the person talks about the most. Uh, if they're always talking about themselves, mm, I don't want to use the N word, but I will. They might be a narcissist. Uh, if they're just, you know, able to talk about you and them, uh, they're confiding in you. If they're talking about they and them, they might be a gossip. Uh, understanding the use of metaphor mm -hmm, or simile. And that gives you a pretty good snapshot of the depth of their, in, not intelligence, because you don't have to have a lot of facts to be intelligent, but the depth of their, ex of their experience of learning and how much they continue to learn. Because a colorful uh, or unusual metaphor comes from a mind that has been exposed to more things. Keep that in, in mind. And with hearing, you're listening actually for the sounds of patterns, of energy, of hesitation, of the, uh, the I don't want to say energy again, but basically the energy of what a person is saying or, or whatever. And that comes from hearing. Then number four, you want to look for the gaps in knowledge. And another thing that I want to make sure you understand is when you can identify gaps in knowledge, uh, when a person appears to be confused, they're hesitant when they're talking to you. Either they ask repetitive questions where they're not progressing or understanding, or they don't ask questions and they're just nodding and they glazed and you're like, they, they're not keeping up. Okay. And then the fifth one, the fifth one is understanding and properly operating within the four types of oration, if you will. Uh, the first one being a discourse where you're saying something that's structured with a point and with uh, persuasion in it, usually to teach someone. You could actually say a discourse is a lecture as well. Um, a lecture is slightly different, but anyway, don't worry about that. Uh, and then you have the ones that require more than one person and that's going to be discussion. That's where everybody on the same playing field trying to just explore and go. Then you move into dialogue where you're having a conversation where you're seeking to be understood. You want to get your point across, but you also have to learn how to keep the conversation moving forward and not always say well back to my point or you didn't or let me finish <laughs> i'm sorry I'm, I'm, anyway focus michelle and then the last part of that is debate debate has a time and a place usually don't debate if you're not skilled in it because there are people out here with masterful skills of rhetoric that's another way of persuading someone uh and it's very it can be very competitive and even combative and in a polite conversation you really kind of want to stay away from debate because it won't end well if you don't understand proper conflict resolution and as an author I tend to use debate, depending on the, the background of the character, I use it to introduce conflict so that I can use the tension to move the character forward. Um, but that's, you know, an author doing something. When it's in real life, it's no fun because it can do ir uh, irreparable damage to a friendship if you get into a heated, and I don't know why people say heated discussion. It's really a heated debate. All right. So, of course, my time is up. I thank you for yours. This has been Michelle with Brilliant Quest. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and uh, tell me what you'd uh, like me to uh, talk about. Thank you so much, and I will see you sooner than later. Bye.